I can hardly believe that we are staring the month of September straight in the face. And uh, it is absolutely crazy to see what, uh, how fast this year has gone past. And I just want to share with you some really exciting news. Yesterday I got an email from Moldova and it was, a, it was dozens of pictures. Uh, in Moldova, school starts in September. Now, with this COVID thing, everything's been thrown upside down, and we didn't know when the school would start, but it appears they're going to try and get them started in September. And over this last weekend, brand new kids started coming to Vatra Village. For those that don't know, let me, give, let me back up and let you know what happens. Our ministry, um, the, the mission outreach of our ministry is called The Orphan's Hands. And in Moldova and the Ukraine, those are, those are poverty-stricken, corruption-stricken countries. Moldova is the poorest country in all of Europe. It is like Africa in Europe. But the only problem is in the wintertime, it can go down as low as 30 degrees below zero. It is, a, it is a bitterly cold place, unforgiving place. And in that country, when kids turn 16, or sometimes they never get to the orphanage, but they live in these horrendous conditions in poverty-stricken villages. Traffickers come and offer them fake jobs. And these kids will get in a car and, and within 24 hours are being beaten and raped until they, until they are broken. And then they sell them, literally, standing beside the road. And they use them anywhere from 50, 30 to 50 times a day. Each girl can make up to $300,000 a year for the trafficker. You're hearing a lot about trafficking today in America. How this government is stomping out and they're discovering kids in Georgia. There are a whole bunch of kids the other day. So that's what our ministry has been doing for many, many years. So we have a place called Vatra Village, and you'll see a picture of it just now. We have a place called Vatra Village, and it is a village of homes where we take these kids from the orphanage. Waiting for that picture. There you go. Um, we take these kids from the orphanage into these houses in this village and we take them in and we put them back in school. Most of them have, haven't even bothered trying in school because they've been told every day, you're garbage, you're trash, you're filthy, your mother doesn't want you, you're, you'll never be anything. And we encourage them and we put them back in school, tell them if you're born, God has a plan. And they live in our homes, they learn about the gospel, they become missionaries themselves because they go and start feeding and caring for people in the villages that are starving, widows that have nothing. And our kids, we've, we have found how to break the orphan spirit in their hearts is to let them start to give. And they go out and they love and care. And um, that's just inside one of, the, one of our homes. So this weekend, um, I, you may recall a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I told you about Nadia going to an orphanage three hours away from Kishnau, north of Kishnau. And there was a whole bunch of kids, 22, 24 kids in this orphanage that, were, that had no place to go, no home, n no, no guardians, no uncles, no aunties. They were, they were completely and totally lost. And these are some of the kids you're watching right now. And if you'll notice in one of the pictures, Nadia, who's on the left-hand side of the picture with a white top on, she went along, and hold that picture, Philip, if you would. If you look up the right-hand side of the table, there's a girl with glasses. She is, her name is Jazgul, and Jazgul is the new house parent for this brand new house we've just opened. So they came and they shared with these kids. You heard me talk about this. She shared with these kids, we have a place for you to come. Well, this weekend, they came, and we have had the most crazy weekend because if you also remember, we have a container that we sent away a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it's a week and a half out from Moldova right now. Is going to Odessa and then being trucked down to Moldova. So a whole bunch of our, a whole bunch of the stuff for our house is in that container. But here are these kids arriving with everything they own in the world. You are looking at their entire world, and all of those kids sitting in. Vatra village in their brand new house and um, that's Jazz Ghoul feeding them. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that absolutely unbelievable? And all of these kids without our care and without our love and um, what she's doing right there in that picture, we have rules for the house and, and, and their, for their con conduct. 
and she's sharing with them. And I promise you, as I'm sitting on this chair, they have never been in such a beautiful place in all of their lives. And um, so that's Jazz Ghoul, and this is them out in a grocery store for the first time in their lives. Jazz Ghoul said their eyes were coming out of their head. They'd never seen, never seen this before in their life. And um, so these kids are now our kids, and we are responsible for them, for their dentist, for their doctor, for their clothing, for the cost of their school education. And all of those now are in a brand new house at Vatra Village. And you can help us. This will add an additional $3,000 a month onto the cost of running the ministry in Moldova. And I'm, I'm asking 100 people to give a dollar a day. You can help us. You can change your life for $1 a day. If I took you there, I am sure of this. If I were to stand you in that house today and say, we can, we can care for these kids. By you giving a dollar a day, I'm telling you, there isn't one of you that wouldn't say, I'm in, I can be a part of that. So I pray that you, God will speak to your heart and you can get in contact with us at The Orphan's Hands. Very simple, just theorphanshands.org forward slash give. And by doing so, you can contact us or you can write us at The, at the Orphan's Hands PO Box 242-248 here in Montgomery, Alabama, 36124. Or you can call right this minute and give by phone. And you can just, someone will pick up the phone and you say, I want to help with the kids in the new house. And you give them your, your, your card number. It's completely secure giving. Completely secure giving. And you can give 334-456-5544. But I've been talking about this for about a month now, maybe a month and a half. And the, the day is upon us. And we need a miracle of God to keep this open. When this whole COVID thing began, I said to the kids in Moldova and I said to the Lord, I am not slowing down. I am not, I am not going to back off because if these are your kids, you're going to provide for them. And that's exactly what we've done. And those of you that give a dollar a day and help us, this new book that I wrote concerning my son Andrew is called Our Bummer Lamb. That's Andrew, the day I found him in the orphanage. And um, that crib that he's in, that metal crib, if you see the chips of paint off of it, um, that is lead paint. We had the paint taken off one of those cribs and, and tested here in America. And all their, all their cribs were painted with lead paint. They teethed on, on, on lead paint. And um, so if you would like to help us, this book, The Bummer Lamb, the tremendous story of The Bummer Lamb. Um, in Scotland, when I was a wee boy, my mom would take us out around the countryside, especially in the lambing season. Most amazing thing to watch all these lambs being born all, almost at the same time is crazy. Once in a while, a wee lamb would try and go and, and get milk from its mother. And its mother, for some reason, had rejected it. And she would kick it away and butt it with her head. And we would sit in, in, in the car and watch in horror as this mother, I mean, would have killed this lamb. And every time the shepherd showed up, what a relief it was. And you'd pick up the lamb and you'd put it inside his jacket and take it home and feed, it, feed that wee lamb and care for it. And it was called a bummer lamb. No one wanted it. And I am a bummer lamb. Outside of Jesus, I had no hope. And one day Jesus came and lifted me up and took me into his arms and into his family. And um, so this story of how we found Andrew, my, my son Andrew, to become... Uh, who was a bummer lamb and is now a son and, and heir of the kingdom of God. So if you want to help us in Moldova and support this new house, please do that and we'll send you that book. You'll be blessed beyond measure. I am so excited to have with me today a dear friend for many, many years. I went to this church in the beginning when it was a wee storefront. And um, in fact, one of the most famous moments of my life that I laugh, if ever, if ever I'm telling stories, about my life in my preaching ministry. This is one of them. I was preaching one morning, so I left in Montgomery. It's about an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters drive from here. So I got up early, not, so not to wake in Chrissy. I got up and I got dressed and I put on my shoes and, and, and got in the car and drove up there. So while on the platform, I looked down and discovered that I put on a brown shoe and a black shoe of the exact same pair of shoes. So it felt the same. I didn't know any difference. And I was, so I looked down, and here's a brown shoe and a black shoe. So I stood up, when introduced, I stood up and said, well, I'm, letting you, I'm telling you all now, so you all won't be looking halfway through the service. And I explained myself, 
And I preached that morning with a brown shoe and a black shoe and have never been able to let live it down as long as I've been alive. So I am so thrilled and, and honored to have my dear friend, Randy Fuller. How are you, my brother? I'm doing well, <laughs> Philip. How are you? I Do remember you're... that incident as well. <laughs> that was one of those days. That, I mean, I was an hour and a half, away, an hour and three quarters away from home. So there's no way I could change the situation. So it was either take off my, off my shoes and preach in my socks or just go as I was. And I was so glad it happened in your church and not a highfalutin church. And you all... <laughs> it was fitting. It was fitting. <laughs> you all laughed at me and just... It, it, we just went, uh, went on uh, as, as we are. I'm so glad. I know that God's doing tremendous things in your church. First of all, give us an update. And um, we came across the news wires. It was yesterday that the Alabama University, I mean, we tease about Alabama and Auburn all the time, but seriously, there's been a real outbreak of COVID in the university. What's, what's happening? Well, first of all, the, the main thing was not any particular incident. It was just the fact that 35,000 students came from all over the country and came together. Oh, kids, wow. And then within a few days, they had all of their sorority and fraternity rush and pledge and all of that. And of course, Alabama has earned its um, reputation well as being the number one partying school. So these kids all went to a place mm -hmm. called the Strip that had yeah, all yeah. of the bar. You know where I'm talking about. And so they they just did what college kids do when they leave home and go to college. And uh, the next couple of weeks after that, just. So what what is what is the plans for the university? Are they closing down or what what, what they're doing? Well, the <clears throat> they they've. The um, university has issued out a couple of, uh, they have uh, suspended all um, uh, Greek activities, all sororities, all fraternities, all of that stuff is gone. They, they don't allow them to gather in groups uh, outside of a classroom setting of more than 10. Yeah. And then the mayor of the city shut down all of the nightly entertainment at 5 p.m. Oh my goodness. So their fun time. Um, not the so restaurants. Fun. No, but the, yeah, the, the, yeah, all all the all the bars hangouts. and all of the uh, hangouts. They're they're closing at five, which which will certainly disperse the kids from those areas. But again, you have tremendous economic impact, um, which is already tremendous, uh, and now uh, the redeeming fact that some of the kids came back and. You know, a lot of these kids work in these bars to make their rent, Absolutely. buy groceries. Yeah. And so it's just, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a proponent of uh, the bar life or making Debauchery. a living selling alcohol. <laughs> but, but that's, that's not, that's not my say for those guys. They, if you're going to yeah. let one guy make a living, you need to make the other guy make the, li let the other guy make the living. That's crazy. And, just I mean, my, just my take on it. You and I tease all the time about Alabama football and Auburn football. In Scotland and Europe, they're playing soccer right now, but they're playing to right. empty stadiums. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. A lot of these stadiums have got cut-out characters, people. So the stadiums are full with, with cut-out folks. It's, it's funny to watch. And when you watch the program, like we, we get all the, the shows here on um, NBC, and so what they're doing is they're piping noise from other games into, this, into the game. So it's not a cold game. So you still hear the crowd chanting, and, and, and when, the, when the referee gives a foul, they all scream, or if it's a goal, they all scream. And it's, none of it's real. It's all, it's all being generated digitally. And um, so we are, we are having soccer in, in Europe. Is there any, I, I really don't know, is there any games being played this year by, by the college teams? That's the, that's the plan, but that's yet to be seen. Okay. There is a, there are, well, I'm not going to get into that part of it, but I'll be surprised if they if they play it um, if they play like they plan on playing. I think the SEC, you know, has ten games scheduled. But okay, think about this, Philip. Think about this. What is the what is the number one money making entity in our country? Easy, it's easy entertainment. to tell you. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that what we're doing is is I think Dagon has fallen. Yep. And I. I think Dagon has fallen, and I think we're trying to prop him back up, and I don't think it's going to work very well. What it, it, it's, it looks like, it looks like God has completely 
reset everything. Like Every- God said, okay, this is what you thought was your God. I'm, I'm just going to crush the thing flat on the ground. And as soon as it tries to restart itself, this thing, th- this virus it shows up again and they're going to close it all down again. And I do think, I do think that God is saying to America, God is saying to the world, consider world. your ways. And this Consider country, and as you know, I, I'm I've never been. The only time I'm into American college football is to tease you guys about <laughs> Alabama. I only support I only support Auburn football. because I only support uh, Auburn because you support Alabama. So I've no real emotional <laughs> ties to it. I don't watch any football games except the Alabama Auburn game, so I can tease Derek Drawn and Randy Fuller and Ken Drawn and, I, and, and, and Jay Stewart, these guys, so I can write things and, and get you all excited. <laughs> and I've had some people block me over. It's so funny. I mean, it's because when, when you're not emotionally involved in it and you tease people about it and they get, <laughs> they lose. They get wound Woo! up tight. They lose their sanctification. It is so funny. <laughs> but um, I do believe, I honestly believe that America has made gods out of these things. And um, we, have paid, we, we are paying dearly for this. And what I'm watching, as you've been watching this last few weeks, the last few days, um, when, the, when the basketball guys went on strike and, and uh, you know, LeBron James, what they don't understand is they're setting themselves up, not just for this emotional moment they're in, but a negativity will be put upon them by the by the public for the rest of their careers, and it will it will uh, it won't be good for them. I, pr- I promise you. Whenever basketball or football, remember when the, when they took the knee, and folks stopped, just folk tuned up, tuned out, and stopped watching it. And I really believe that there's gonna be a whiplash against all of these sports um, kingdoms. A lot of these kingdoms, that they are really kingdoms, that, that God's going to exactly. tear them down and break them because you don't, put 100%. Yourself, you don't put yourself above God. 100%. And the other thing is, too, some of the guys that are doing the talking now in professional sports, they're set for life. But what, the, what they don't understand is they're getting ready to cook the goose that laid the egg. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're cutting their own nose off to spite their face. And and I don't care how much money you have. Billionaires didn't become billionaires by being stupid. No. And so when they're when when they when they start hemorrhaging double digit millions, yeah, they'll cut they'll cut it off. They'll just cut it off. Well, I was surprised. You can't play I, if you don't have a team. That I was surprised when um, <laughs> I read something about LeBron James that he he makes millions and millions of dollars, almost like a million dollars a week, from his Nike endorsements. And his shoes are made in China by, by people getting 20 cents an hour. And I, you know, I just think, to me, it, it's kind of hypocritical that a man would, that would be you know, making all these millions off of the backs of, of people making 20 cents an hour that has any, any guts to stand up and say this is wrong or that's wrong. They need, they need to be looking what they're doing. I, I think much more of these guys, if they were to go back and say, hey, listen, we got, we got to fix it with starting at my own feet. And uh, Copernic is with Nike. And uh, so it's, it's, a real, it's a real crazy thing. And also, I don't know if you saw the, the basketball players. I don't, I don't know why I'm talking sports with you. And I know so little about American <laughs> sport. It's embarrassing. It really is embarrassing. I can tell you what's happening in Manchester United today, but that's about all. But it's, it's just, it feels that these guys have really put themselves out on a limb um, in what they're talking about just now. It's, you know, Philip, Jesus said, uh, a man's heart is where his treasure is. Yeah. So what I would like, I would love for people like LeBron James or anyone, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, tout a cause show people where you are investing you know it's easy to shout from the sidelines i mean it's like me him telling people without him contributing anything to rectify quote unquote systemic racism if he hasn't invested anything in it it's like me standing on the sidelines watching him play and telling him how to go to the hoop wow i mean all he needs to do is throw me throw me the ball and say show me bro yeah 
And so yeah. if you don't have any skin in the game, you're just it's just chatter. Yeah, that is that is true. So anyway, moving moving away from the <laughs> moving sports <on>. world. <laughs> moving away from the sports world. Moving on. Tell us what the Lord's been doing in the church and what the Lord's been laying on your heart these last few weeks since I saw you last. Well, we've had a lot of people, Philip, as you know, has happened in a lot of churches. We've had a lot of people that went out with the virus and are still out. And uh, I don't know if they'll ever come back. And we've had people that went out with the virus and came back. <clears throat> we've had people from other churches come flocking in for whatever reason. One of the things that I think that there's a couple of factors at play, some of which I'm not at liberty to discuss, but one of the things that God's really been blessing us uh, personally with is during the middle of all of this um, virus and pandemic, we began just simply doing a little Facebook blog. I'd never been on Facebook before. We started doing that called a morning it's word. Yeah. And, and so now we have a lot of people who have shared that. And, and we we have people sitting in our seats today in our church who got connected to me through Facebook and to, through the church yeah. and to the, the Facebook page and to the church. That way they just, they just come in and I'm just going, so we've really gained more than we lost. Uh, we are unable to completely and adequately. Uh, we have a section that we set apart for social distancing and people that want to wear masks and yeah, yeah. and also a, pri a private entrance. But uh, outside of that little area that we have for them, uh, it's it's elbow to elbow, and so God's really blessed in that way. So that's I, I that's I something do... that the Lord is has has blessed me with in the last five or six months. I do think that. You, you chose to go back to have services. Right. And, and those that want to congregate, those that, that are compelled in their hearts to, to go to church. Right. If, if their own church wasn't having church services and they're looking for that personal experience, then, then it's, it's almost unnatural that you'll try to start looking for the church that's closest to where your heart is in your, in your belief system and, and what you see God doing in the world today. And you'll go and find that people. And, and I've said this several times to, to a number of pastors that um, there is a risk of meeting together, but there's also a, a great, I believe, a greater long-term risk. We, we talk about Le, LeBron James. Uh, what's going to happen is it isn't the day that matters. It's it's after right. all the after all the emotion is gone and the, and the adrenaline's gone, the cold business aspect of it six months from now starts showing up. And they'll be saying, wow, there's no one coming to our basketball games. I know why. I, people, I, I will never watch another NFL football game because of what happened um, last year or the year before with the kneeling for the national anthem. I just won't watch it. Just not, not, it's, it's out of my mind completely. And I think that the churches that are actually having church are, um, yes. are opening themselves up to folks saying, listen, I need, to, I need to be in church. I need to stand in a pew and worship God. And um, I think th there'll be a great separation of congregations at that one point alone. That, absolutely. We, you and I know, and your listeners and watchers know, that, that the church is made up, the church is not concrete and mortar. Uh, but the church, from its inception, was always gathered. It was somewhere. It was in a home. It was outside. It was on a mountain. It was yep. by the sea. But you don't have a church that's not gathered. If you separate a church uh, indefinitely, to which I, I ask people all the time, and I ask them respectfully, you know, if you're going to stay home for a year and we're working on seven months and yeah. this thing just got extended through October, if you're going to stay home for a year and thrive spiritually, and I'm just I'm just assuming that would ha is what's going to happen to you, you're going to thrive spiritually, you're going to be able to, stay at home in your pajamas and just have church via the internet or TV. Now, if that's the game, then why ever go back? Yeah. Why true. ever go back? And so, yeah. and so a church that's scattered like that is like a fire that's scattered. The wood, when it's separated, uh, uh, whatever you had going goes out. And yeah, so yeah. what, whatever the church choose, the, the individual churches chooses to do, the one thing that is not that is not negotiable 
is it has to gather somewhere yep. and in some yep. capacity. It has to gather. There's wow. there. It's an oxymoronic that you can have a church that's not gathered. That's so true. That is so true. And the scripture speaks of being scattered. I mean, there's a spiritual implication about being scattered. Something happens psychologically and spiritually. No doubt. When you walk into a church door and you sit down in a pew and they start playing music and it, it, and folk begin to sing hymns, the commonality, everyone has the same, they, they know the song and they begin to praise God and you lift your hands and folk around you lift their hands and, and, and something happens, there's a sense of belonging. That's why, that's why the scripture says, forgetting not the assembling of yourselves together. Something yes. happens when we get together. And as you say, I, I honestly feel that a lot of folk that have spent and um, Andy Stanley's church in Atlanta, for example, they have announced already that they are not going to have any services until 2021. Hold on, I've lost your audio. I don't know why, but I've lost your audio. You clapped your hands and you broke your, your, your microphone, I think. Check and see. But let me, obviously, I always... Obviously, I hit a raw nerve in Randy Fuller's. Um, I still can't hear that. <laughs> but Andy Stanley has said that he won't have church until 2021, and um, at that point, you are you are. You know, where will where will the church? You know, where will the church? Be? Um, I'm being told that you may have to you may have to disconnect and reconnect, Randy. I'm watching you on my internal screen, and um, there you go. You're back. I can. You can. You can continue your. You, took it all. Uh, you can. I obviously hit a raw nerve with you when you clapped your hands. Well, here's the deal, okay? And I, and I I've, I I've had to I've addressed this situation, um, personally with some people that go to church over there or did go to church over there, and yeah. and here this this goes back to the original statement. If you're going to suspend your church for a year, why go back? Yeah. Why would those people go back? The other thing is, 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 you know, Andy Stanley can afford to do that. I mean, he's made millions on his uh, books and so forth. So he's really not out of it. He's not, any, he's not. De In other words, Andy Stanley is not congregationally dependent. Yeah. He's independent. So so if he's going to suspend, now get this, when, when Jesus told Peter, he said, feed my sheep. So basically what Andy Stanley says is, I'm not going to feed you guys for a year, but if you can find you some scraps somewhere, we'll come back here in a, in a year and meet again. I'm going, why won't I just go and stay where I'm being fed? Yep, that's true. I mean, that's so true. I mean, you, you did, you struck a nerve with me. I mean, it's true. It's it's absolutely. I'm you. I'm called to pastor a church. He's called to pastor a church, and it's not my fault. And let me tell you. Let me go on and tell you. And this will, this will make people mad. And again, get in line for the people that are mad at me. It's not my fault that he has thirty thousand people that he can't manage. You yeah. can't manage thirty thousand people congregating together in a pandemic. So his success has become his greatest liability. Yeah. And what, instead of one church with 30,000 people, you should have had 300 churches with 100 people. Yeah. And then he has a manageable problem. That is true. Wow. I never thought of that before. I never thought the bigger the, bigger the crowd, the, the bigger the liability, isn't it? That's so true. Hey, we're playing high school football because we have 400 people. But they can't play. They can't put 102,000 people in Denny Stadium. Wow. So your wow. your your success is so what? Uh, again, I think God's busting up the. Uh, I think God's busting up the uh, multi-campus one pastor church where everybody goes to one place and gets fed. I think He says, "Hey, listen, for every church I plant, go back to My Word, and God plant in an elder or elders to preach and to teach the gospel." Yeah. So now Andy Stanley has 30,000 people, which in essence should be 300 churches, and they have one pastor. So when he says go home, they have no choice. Yeah. 
Well, I do. I mean, I I, I do know. I do know. I, and, and I've I've got friends who've got huge churches, multi-campus, and um, the the issues that they are facing is absolutely um, just it's it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like trying to manage a city, and uh, we don't have the resources to manage a city. <laughs> and I, I do think, and I, I do realize, and, and uh, getting back to your personal situation, I believe that the folk that have been coming back in, in your church or coming for the first time in your church are the direct result of having been to church, want to go to church, church is deprived of them as they know it, and they start seeking other places, other avenues. And what Absolutely. What, well, you think you lock people up. You basically send people home for seven or eight weeks and they have no social life, no school going on, no sports going on, can't go to work. And so the one thing that they want to do is get together with their church people and they go, no, we're not opening the doors. And then they say, you can only have 10 people in social distance. And I said, no, dude, if we open the doors, we're going to church. And that's yeah. what we did. And have you had and, any, uh, out, have you had any uh, you know, fallout from that? Oh yeah, yeah. We get fallout from that, but I just, I just roll with it. <laughs> they don't know, they don't know very much about Randy Fuller if they think they're going to intimidate you. I don't believe. <laughs> Philip, let me tell you. I want to tell you something. I want to be completely honest with you and your and your your listeners here. One of the reasons that I went to, we had we had we were going to three services one time. We cut it back to two, and it was like pastoring two churches. And so we went to one and we had a lot of people leave and we changed our times. But but I, I I saw where we had people that went to church here for 10 years in one service that didn't know the people that went to church the other 10 years here in the other service. And I said, I'm not I'm not doing that anymore. So I know it's going to cost us people and resources and so forth. But I'm going to only pastor as many people as I can put in this building. And that's all I want. And that's all I care to have. Yeah. But. On top, on top of that, that's why I do that. But on top of that, when when we have church and 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 the, we shut down, I have to confess, we shut down and went on Facebook for a while because no one there was the great unknown. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's known. The facts are known. We've been with it enough. And so, quite simply, I'm like this: you guys, and I'm talking about the government. You guys have enough on your plate with the burning cities. Yeah. and the natural catastrophes and and the monetary loss we're having church you take care of your business i'll take care of my business and that's pretty much they haven't really given us any grief our christian school has come under a lot of grief we've we've had to fight that on you don't have enough air time left for me to tell you about how we've been fighting that but really? here's what we found out my grandkids are all in christian school and, it, and there's been no there's been no controversy against that as far as i know unless my son hasn't told they, me do they wear masks and social distance? Philip, do they wear masks and social distance? Uh, first graders, uh, second graders do not have to wear masks. First, first graders don't have to wear masks. And, and second grade and above do, right? It all depends how many kids are in the classroom. Doesn't have to wear a mask they can sit far enough apart that they don't have to wear a mask. My 11 year old um, granddaughter doesn't have to wear a mask because they can sit far enough. The, the classes are very small. It's a brilliant school my grandkids go to. So they've had no issues. And I mean, they started school as regular and are doing the normal stuff. And we can't tell any difference in that. So, um, you know, that, that's our that's our experience here in Montgomery. It may be different well, in our um, position, Tuscaloosa. Our position in our church and our position in our school is this. <clears throat> you can you can reserve a spot for social distancing if you want, and we will provide it in the church. Yeah. You can wear a mask if you want. It's everyone's choice. Nothing is mandated. And we had some people took us to task about that, only to find out that the state of Alabama, the the, the uh, law, the mandate is written so that no one has the legal authority to act, absolutely shut anything down. They can only strongly suggest it. Really? So when, when, when Governor Ivey was on TV the other day and, and extended this mask thing until October, um, that's only when it boils down to it, it's a suggestion. It isn't real honest to God law. Well, 
if you listen to what she said when she initially initiated it, she said, we're not someone asked, how are you going to enforce it? And she said, huh. are you going to are you going to commit police officers and resources? She says, no, we're not going to go around writing citations and incarcerating people over a mask. We're just going to hope that people will do the right thing. And that's what they're 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 leaning on the fact that you will do what they say. Now, I don't have a problem wearing a mask. I don't have a problem social distancing. What I have a problem is, is that if I don't want to do it, or if this other guy over here doesn't want to do it, that you're going to come in and try to strong arm me and tell me that I have to do it. And I'm, that's, that's when the leather meets the road. And that's when we say, Oh no, that's just, that's just yeah. not how it's going to roll here. Yeah. Because I, I, I sense as I travel and as I'm talking to people, I'm kind of like a clearing house of a whole bunch of opinions in our, in our life. People pastors from everywhere call me. And I feel a real weariness of this thing, saying, listen, guys, we've done what we've been told. We've, we've done all that. I mean, the whole point of this, the whole point of social distancing in the beginning was so that we wouldn't overburden the hospital system in America. That was that if you don't if you don't know this, the reason why social distancing and all of this was put in place was that we didn't want to burden the healthcare systems of America and and cause people that needed ventilators and needed all this stuff couldn't get it. That was the point of it. So what's happened is, um, as you heard President Trump speak so clearly a few days ago, that they have produced tens of thousands of ventilators. Not one American that needed a ventilator was denied one. And we now have an excess to the point that we are giving them away to other countries. So the, the point of social distancing in the beginning, if you'll recall, all those months ago, Two things, we don't want we don't want to burden our healthcare system, and two, wearing a mask will not help you. It's a waste of time. The microns, and in fact, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook, Randy, but there's a guy, this doctor, an anesthesiologist, and he and he wears all these different masks, and he vapes to show the the smoke, and the vape um, molecule is bigger than the than the COVID molecule so he puts a mask on and said this is the one that you see mostly and he put this mask on and he sucked this vape thing and it just gushed out of the mask and he went through every single mask available and whenever he breathed out the smoke came out over his head round his ears out of the mask and he basically said everything you try is an absolute waste of time so the science I'm hearing them talk to us all the time, you know, follow the science. You've got to do what the science tells you. Well, Fauci told me six months ago that me wearing a mask was a total and absolute waste of time. And in that intervening six months, they've socially engineered us to the point that the only thing we can do now is wear a mask. The mask that they're telling me that is useless. So now the mask has become the, the, the focal point. Um, we were in a place, Andrew and, and, and myself and some of the guys were coming back from a church service. And um, we stopped, where was it, Andrew? We stopped at Zaxby's. We stopped, stopped at Zaxby's and um, Andrew didn't have a mask on. Well, this woman came in and she nearly had a conniption in that place. She was screaming at him, screaming at the lady. And um, it was absolutely, there's no signs of the door. We just went in. We weren't disobeying any, um, you know, procedure. And and what what the mask has done, it has been used as another divisive tool in a country that is divided over everything. We have been Absolutely. split and split and split and split and split again over non-essential things. That's what ticks me off. So I've got pastors t calling me saying, I don't believe, that, I can't believe that you're encouraging pastors of church. I'm not. I'm encouraging pastors to do what the Lord has told them to do. And you should be thrilled that pastors like Randy Fuller have enough courage to say, no, we are a church and God and the power of the Holy Ghost is enough to take care of us. If we do what we can do, the rest is obedience. Then I've got pastors that are saying to me, I can't do it. I've, I've had COVID myself. I'm concerned. I'm, I don't feel, I don't feel you know, released to do it. And I'll say, that's exactly fine. What you want to do is fine. But everything I'm seeing, Randy, is being used by the devil to divide us and split us up. And the Bible says a house divided against itself cannot stand. 
It can't stand. And that's what the devil wants for America. Absolutely. Absolutely, Philip. And I just want to make sure to, to make this perfectly clear to all of your people. I believe in the, the uh, veracity and the non-negotiable truth of God's word. And yes. I believe in the freedoms that were granted to us by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States and Bill of Rights. Yes. So therefore, I believe that every person, individual, should have the, uh, the right to decide for themselves how they are going to approach this I agree with you. pandemic. Yeah. And so therefore, whether that be a pastor, his church, a father, his family, you know, Andy Stanley can do what he wanted to do what he wants to do. I, 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 I get frustrated with his model and his model came back and bit him. That's why I, I kind of toot that horn. But the point is, is that I'm for everyone being able to choose. And if you wanted me to interview me and you wanted me to wear a mask, so because you were wearing a mask because you want to show solidarity on your show, I would do that to honor you. Yeah. But if you came on and said, you can't be on my show if you don't wear a mask, I'd say, well, don't call me again. <laughs> I, 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 I can promise you this, Randy. I wouldn't ever call you to tell you to do anything because I know you well <laughs> enough that you're a big enough rebel that you would be saying, hold on, I caught and pick in a minute. And, uh, but it's so true. I mean, we, we've got to stop this Phil, nonsense of division over, over the wanna, non-essential stuff. I want to share this. I have people, I've had people that really, church people, really chastise me about not walking in love towards uh, a fellow believer who wants me to wear a mask for them. And I just want to, I, I just want to, I want to tell everyone that I am walking in love, but I want to tell you who I'm walking in love toward. I'm not, I'm not walking in love on, in their interpretation uh, towards those who are paralyzed with fear. I am walking in love towards the men and the women yeah. who came home without all their body parts and in flag draped coffins to give us a freedom that we are going to surrender and never, never to return. Any, any rope we give out now will never come back to never us. Never come back. And so when people say, well, are you, are you an American first and a Christian? I go, no, I'm a Christian American. I'm a prophet and a patriot. Yeah. And, and this country was founded on great sacrifice. And they, matter of fact, the bloodiest war we ever fought was over ideologies and freedoms, the Civil War. But there are some things that have to be fought for. And before there's a fight, there's a stand. And before there's a stand, there's a principle. And before there's a principle, there's a promise. Yes. So I, that's where I stand. That's amazing. I couldn't have said it better. That's where I stand. And so to, it may not be loving to those who want to wear masks, but to those who fought for the freedom for us to be able to choose. And if you choose one, I promise you, I've never hemmed anyone up in a corner and go, why are you wearing that mask? But by the same token, I don't want you to get me in the corner and go, why are you not wearing a mask? Wear I one agree. if you want to wear one, yeah. but leave me alone if I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that, Andrew. I, I, I was in the Zaxby's. Andrew came out and he says, Man, dad, you should have been in there just now. This woman went off in every which direction. And of course, <laughs> Andrew, Andrew just looked at her with a bemused smile, which irritated her even worse. Because if you don't rise to their bait, then that, then that makes them ten. Because the whole point of this. The whole point, what you're watching on the streets of America right now, the battle that's going on for the, in the streets of America is to, for one thing only, is for us to acquiesce to what they want us to do. They want us to bow down to what they believe is our portion. And I'm here to tell you something. It isn't my portion. I reject it completely. And I speak against it, and we'll speak. I don't care how many folk will contact me and say, "Oh, Philip, you know, you, you're 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 hate-filled." I'm not hate-filled. There's an ounce of hate in my heart, not an ounce of hate in my heart. I have I have no racist points in my being at all. None. 
I respect black people like I respect white people. I res but I don't respect anyone of any color that treats and, and it goes against what I believe is a standard of the gospel of Jesus. That is not a color thing. That's a character thing. And there's a big difference between the two. And you are watching, Absolutely. I'm telling just... you now, you are watching the streets of America, a battle of, of wearing down. They want to wear you down to the point that you will say, ah, well, okay, 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 okay. And I'll tell you what, as, as Randy said so profoundly, the rope we lose right now, we will never, ever get back. Because they know that they can close the church down. They know it now. They know it. The government and, and darkness beyond the government know that they have the power and they can have the psychological victory over us that they can tell us to do something and we will comply and then they'll comply with your cash to society and then they'll comply with a chip in your hand or your forehead and we will walk ourselves into the mark of the beast and we will we will be the ones that have given the ground away one inch at a time absolutely Help and us. i want i want your i want your um your viewers to know this because someone will probably have heard me or heard a snippet of this and go that guy's a racist and um so let me just set that straight first of all i'm white and i'm proudly white because god Absolutely. made me white so i'm Absolutely. not going to apologize for that secondly and you're a I man as well <laughs> and i'm a man as well yeah that's right no matter how i feel and uh my wife and i by choice handpicked and adopted biracial children yeah so the race car doesn't sit very well with me. Uh, my yeah. sister and her husband adopted a biracial child. Uh, my mother, when we were children, we we uh, we fostered um, uh, children of color of all different colors. Yeah. And so uh, my my family and my family history is is like a rainbow. So uh, I, I'm, there's not a racist bone in my body. I'm proudly white because God made me that way. And I've got brown skinned children. But my, my point only, is this. My only brother's a black man. My only that's brother's what you a told me. Man. Absolutely. That's what you, you told me. And uh, so, Philip, I'm not for the government telling me anything, particularly about what to preach and when to preach and how to have church. And so that's where I draw the line. Yeah. I'm not an insurrectionist. But, but here's the deal. And, and I think your people that are watching you understand this. Here's the world that we live in. It's when the people who speak up with the voice of life, love, and liberty are made to be yeah. uh, the bad guys. The criminals. The criminal. The, it's mind-blowing. To, to say, if I say, I'm standing up for how we've always done church, now I'm the bad guy. If I yeah. say I said I'm I'm for I'm for going back to school the way we've always done it. Now I'm an insurrectionist. Yeah. And, if I'm I mean, for And they'll use they'll use any means possible. I just saw it. Did you see the thing about the, the, the CDC announcing how many deaths there's actually been from COVID? It's gone down to less than ten thousand deaths. They have stopped a country's economy, caused unbelievable suffering around the world. And it's all an exaggerated lie. So CNN, the joker at CNN is standing with fires burning behind him saying it's a mostly peaceful uh, demonstration. Because they, all they know is to do is to, pr is to promote lies. And they, if, if you tell a lie enough and scream a lie loud enough, folk will believe it. And I'm here to tell you something. We are going to stand for the truth a daily faith. I know you are in new beginnings. I honor you because you you have such courage and faith. I, I love that. We have less than four minutes to go. Will you pray that God give us peace in this storm? That God will help us to see to see us through this thing. Can you pray right now? Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Heavenly Father, we just pray and seek your face right now, Father God, for the calmness and the peace that Jesus demonstrated for his disciples in the boat, in a storm in which seasoned uh, men of the sea were afraid of their life for their lives. And when he awakened uh, to their screams, he said, Oh, ye of little faith. 
And he spoke a word, Father, and immediately the seas were still. And the disciples looked at one another and go, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Father God, you are the same one who abides with us now. There is nothing happening outside of your purview. But God, your word says in Luke 18, chapter uh, 18, chapter verse one says, when you return to the earth, will you really find faith? Father God, people that will just take you at your word, believe you and stand and having done all to stand. God, we're not insurrectionists. God, we're not rebels. We're not racist. Just believers that stand on the word of God. And for what we believe, the word of God promotes is right. So God, help us to have peace that who we stand with and who stands with us is still alive and in charge. And secondly, that the things that we believe in are still true. They're not antiquated. They're not irrelevant. They, they, they'll do to live by. They'll do to die by. We thank you for your great love and the promise of your abiding presence. And we pray and ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what, I believe that program is one of the most important programs we've done because we've faced face-to-face -face some facts. And um, I love Randy Fuller. He's a great man of God. He, he pastors a church called New Beginnings um, Family Worship Center in Northport, which is in Tuscaloosa, basically. And their website is www.newbeginningsfwc.com. There it is on the screen. And I urge you, this is a great man of God. If you want a church that has purpose and passion in their foundations. This is one of those churches and you'll be blessed by being there. Thank you, Randy, for coming, my brother. I love you so much. And um, love you, Pip. Just, Thank you for having me. I'm just telling all the folk to send their postcards and letters to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See if you, hey, listen, if you don't hear from me in a while, check and make sure I'm not incarcerated and I need bail, all right? <laughs> I'll come and get you, I promise. I love you, there my you friend. Go, buddy. Hey, bye bye. Love you, buddy. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye bye. Wow, was that wonderful? Was that absolutely amazing? He is like, man. I, I wish, I wish that the church could see things so clearly as he does. If you want to go to his Facebook, he he did something a, a couple of weeks ago that was just, he was on fire. And I thought, whoa, we need more pastors that have enough passion. Because if we don't, if, I'm telling you guys, if we don't stand for something, we're going to fall for anything. If we don't make a line in the sand and say, this is where we stop, right here, we're stopping here. And um, when I hear churches not even thinking about having church until next year, we are, we are going to, um, you know, it's going to be a tremendous loss. We love you. Thank you for joining with us today at Daily Faith. Uh, tomorrow, my guest is Andy Colagrasso, a great friend of ours. And uh, you'll enjoy his ministry tomorrow as well. And please pray, if you could, about being part of this miracle we need right now in Vatra Village. The girls are there. Um, we have started. The meter is running. The price is going. The costs are running now. And we need you to believe God with us. If I can get 100 people to give $1 a day, $30 a month, to keep this house open and keep these girls safe, I believe that God wants you to do that. Contact us. You can change your life. For one dollar a day, and that's the contact information, the orphanshands.org forward slash give. And you can be part of the greatest miracle that these kids have ever realized the miracle of grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. You can be a part of this miracle. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. And, and those who do that will give you the book, Andrew's book, uh, The Bummer Lamb. We love you. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. For over 25 years, the Cameron family has been changing the lives of orphans in Romania and Moldova. From providing running water, flushing toilets, and clean wells, to coal for heat, new windows, as well as food and clothing, they champion the physical needs of the orphans in these broken and desolate countries. Many of Moldova's orphans are saved from the horrors of trafficking through homes founded by the Camerons, and in the process, Orphans become daughters and sons. They come to know their Heavenly Father and are forever changed by the love of Jesus. God help the Camerons lift these amazing young men and women out of darkness. Now, no longer orphans, they want to return and invade that very same darkness with the light of Jesus Christ. The Orphan's Hands equips these daughters and sons to become missionaries. 
Your monthly gift of $31 will allow us to rescue and take in more girls and boys, saving them from the hell of human trafficking. Your monthly partnership will allow us to care for those in the orphans' hands homes in Moldova and the Ukraine. When you partner with us on a monthly basis, giving a dollar a day, you will receive every 30 seconds a testimonial book of the lives changed by the orphans' hands. If you want to join Philip and Chrissy in taking care of these precious young people, please contact us today by calling 833 Daily Faith. You can also give by going online to philipdcameron.com or by writing to Post Office Box 242246, Montgomery, Alabama 36124. So many lives depend on what we do. Thank you for loving the lost. Philip would love to hear from you. If there is a need for prayer in your life and you want him to pray for your unsaved loved ones, reach out to Philip at 833 Daily Faith. We believe for great things for you. Contact him today. If you are a pastor, church leader, or business owner and would like to have Philip Cameron come and speak to your church, conference, or event, please call 1 833 Daily Faith or go to pastors.philipdcameron.com or request by mail at attention Andrew Cameron Post Office Box 242246 Montgomery, Alabama 36124